All right. I'm posting the captioning link one more time in the chat. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alexa and I'm your tech support today, as I've said a few times. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get us all set up with how to best set up your Zoom to get the most out of the presentation today. So thank you for joining the Connecting with Everyone workshop. Um, right now we've got 166 people on the, on the presentation, which is great. For the best viewing today, we want everyone to select gallery view. That's in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And then if you select one of the participants who doesn't have their video on the three dots in the corner, there will be a selection that drops down that says select hide non video participants. And this will allow everyone else on the call to disappear for you and for you to just see the interpreters and the presenters. So that's why we're asking everyone to keep your video off today so we can just see our interpreters and our presenters. Now, when we have the presentation up, there will also be an option at the very, very top of the Zoom screen under view options, where you can select side-by-side -side mode. And this will let you see the presentation and our presenters and interpreters right on the side. We do have live captioning available. Visit bit.ly slash s-t-r-e-a-m t-e-x-t s-c-a-c. And we're also posting that link in the chat. Uh, my colleague Alex Diaz is also posting some helpful Zoom tips for where to find these selections that I've explained above. Make sure you keep your mic and your video off and use the chat box to communicate. We'll be able to respond to you there. The instructions uh, should be similar for those connecting on an iPad. If you're having any other technical challenge or if you have any accessibility needs, please post those in the chat box and one of our team members will offer support. And there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation so we're going to use the chat box to submit all of your questions and we will answer as many questions as possible in the allocated time. This webinar is an hour and a half and we'll have a brief break midway through. And just a little bit about me, I'm Alexa Laycock and I'm actually from Rooted in Rights and we're a Seattle based media advocacy organization that's part of Disability Rights Washington. And Disability Rights Washington is the protection and advocacy organization for Washington State that protects the rights of people with disabilities statewide. As I mentioned, I'll be supporting, um, I'll be your tech support today, along with my colleague Alex Diaz. So you can message either of us throughout the presentation. And welcome to Connecting with Everyone, Creating Accessible Virtual Arts Programs. Next, please, Rachel. Um, in answer to some questions about mobile before I get started, uh, I don't know if there is a side-by-side -side option depending on your cell phone. But Alex, if you could look into that and post, that would be great. So first, our shared agreements. This is a safe space. We respect all efforts to work on accessibility issues in your organization. The fact that you're here is a big deal. We recognize that each organization is at varying levels of accomplishment with accessibility. We are here to help and not to judge. We are diligent in studying and researching our resources and are interested in learning about those we may have missed. Next, please, Rachel. So our over, uh, workshop overview. First, we'll have the presentation by Elizabeth Ralston, an introduction to the consortium and goals of the presentation. We'll cover why virtual arts experiences should be accessible and give examples of accessibility and considerations for planning. We'll also give accessibility solutions. We'll have a 
one minute intermission, and then accessibility examples. The second part is going to be a moderated discussion with Kathy Say, Nikki Rowe, and Helen Marion. And then that will follow with a Q&A. Next, please. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Elizabeth Ralston. Uh, Elizabeth, she, her pronouns, has more than 20 years of experience working with nonprofits, government agencies, and academic institutions. She has a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Michigan and a Certificate of Nonprofit Management from the University of Washington. As a Peace Corps volunteer, Elizabeth experienced firsthand the powerful impact a person can have on others' lives. She has devoted her life to public service ever since. Elizabeth is deaf and uses two cochlear implants to hear. She is an avid patron of the arts. She founded the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium, a grassroots effort to connect arts and cultural organizations with information and resources to improve accessibility for people of all abilities. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thanks, Alexa, for that great introduction. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you're all safe and happy. And before I begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. I would also like to thank our workshop funder, the Office of Arts and Culture, and our host, Rudin and White, for the tremendous help with putting on this workshop. On this slide, you'll see the logo of the Office of Arts and Culture. There's a blue capital A with an N symbol nestled inside a large letter C and the words Office of Arts and Culture Seattle below it. And on the right side is the ruler and white logo. It's a black rectangle. Inside it is a small square on the left with a colorful tree and roots with roots and two small R's on either side. One R is backward facing and the other R is forward facing. Next to that are the words Rooted in Rights and the website rootedinrights.org on the bottom. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you about the work of the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Our mission is connecting arts and cultural organizations with information and resources to improve accessibility for people of all abilities. We are fiscally sponsored by Sunpike. On the right hand side of the slide, we have the word Sunpike in red. As Alexa mentioned, I'm an avid patron of the arts. Growing up as a deaf person did not stop my parents from taking me to arts and cultural events, but most of those were inaccessible. There was no captioning. I relied on reading scripts in dark theaters where I had to use a small flashlight. And there were many times I got scolded for using that tiny light. And it was often difficult to explain to staff why I needed a script. Having my public health hat on, I've been thinking about health inequity and the implications this has on a person with a disability being able to access the arts anytime. Even though I could go to Captain's show at the theater, I could not go whenever I wanted. There was only usually one Captain performance during the show's run. In 1997, I saw my first Captain movie, The Titanic. Imagine my utter delight sitting in a darkened theater, finally being able to understand what the dialogue and the songs were. In fact, Soon after, I worked with some friends and allies to bring captioning to the Cinerama in Seattle, which was being renovated. It spread to many theaters in the area after that. So as you can see, I have been an advocate for accessibility for a long time. I decided to use my public health and nonprofit management experience working with organizations on capacity building, communications, and program delivery to work more closely on accessibility issues in the arts. So starting the consortium was a natural next step. Next, please. 
I'm really happy to be spending this next hour plus with you. As you know, these workshops are a huge team effort. The Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium asks that you consider making a donation to support our mission and future workshops. Together, we can increase accessibility. You can donate here at bit period ly slash SCAC Sunpike. I will be posting that in the chat box as well. So let's talk about the goals. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the goals for today's presentation. They are the following. First, I'd like you to understand why accessibility needs to be integrated into arts programming from the very beginning, including virtual and live streaming platforms. Second, I'd like to review the ways to increase, create inclusive content for people of all abilities. For example, through captioning, interpreters, audio description, and considering unique and alternative formats for those who may need them. And finally, we have some guests here who will discuss and explore how universal design practices lead to more inclusive experiences for all. Next, please. So let's talk about why virtual arts programs should be accessible. Because of what's happening around us right now, virtual programming might be the new normal for a while. We could all benefit from having multiple options to participate in enjoying the arts. Secondly, the arts can be enjoyed by everyone. Many audiences can participate. Deaf and hard of hearing, blind and low vision, people with physical disabilities, and also those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And third, the population is aging. In fact, by 2030, only 10 years from now, one in five people will be 65 and over. Think about this. There, there's a huge population and elderly people are more likely to develop disabilities as they age. Next, please. Accessibility needs to be integrated in the planning and implementation process. Having a plan will save money in the long run. Rather than responding to requests as they come in and operating from a crisis mentality, this is a more forward-thinking approach. This plan would include things like an accessibility audit or self-evaluation, looking at where are the strengths and where are the gaps, including a budget for captioners, interpreters, audio description, and other sensory-friendly accommodations, planning for staff and board trainings, and so on. You might even think about looking at your hiring practices or any of your employees, people with disabilities. Having a well thought out plan of action will help your organization reach more people and be more accessible and welcoming. Next, please. So let's get on board. This slide has an image of the letters get on board, all in black font with different color backgrounds and the statement getting buy-in from upper management and the board will help your case. You need buy-in from management and the board to make this happen. They need to understand that there is a segment of the population they are not reaching. Plus, it makes good business sense. Next, please. So what do we mean by virtual arts experiences? Here are some examples. Live streaming arts performances on a virtual platform, such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Mixer, Zoom, or Google Hangouts. Videos of museum tours, performances, poetry readings, audio described tours, performances, events, etc. And I will give you some examples of these a little bit later. Next, please. So, what are some considerations when planning your virtual event? When you create your art piece, be sure to include people with disabilities in your performances and events. And this includes disabled actors and planners, and even behind the scenes people to help with running your event. Also, assume people with disabilities will be attending your virtual events. These events will be available to more people than ever before, 
simply because of all the amazing technology out there. Next, please. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is technology considerations. And this is a lot of information, so I'm going to be talking up a blue streak in the next few minutes. Nowadays, many platforms have accessibility functions, so it would be good to get familiar with those functions of your platform, as well as social media used to promote your event, such as Facebook Live, Instagram, or YouTube. You may have to manually enable some features. Is the platform compatible with assistive technology like screen readers, which are software programs that allow blind or low vision users to read the text that is displayed on the computer screen with a speech synthesizer or braille display. If it's not, then this segment of the population would be inadvertently excluded. For example, Instagram and Twitter require you to turn on alt text so you can enter image description for screen readers. Alt text is a way of entering text into an image so that blind or low vision people know what the image is. For particip participatory events, ensure the platform allows for computer-based audio listening and phone-based audio listening and speaking, meaning there should be an option to call in as well as using the computer itself. As an example, when there are virtual meetings, I can call in with a caption app on my phone to benefit from the dialogue. Finally, think about whether the participant would need to have an account on the platform in order to participate. Next, please. Let's talk about marketing and communication considerations. You will get a much better participation rate if you market the event well and include accessibility information in those materials. People with disabilities won't come because they will assume it's not accessible, so your messaging has to include them in this process. Offer all accessibility information upfront and publicly to increase access. The more you make it known that your event is accessible, the more people will flock to your program. One way to do this is to share the format and timing of the event in advance. Is it a discussion versus listening to a presentation or something else? How long will it run for? Also, provide any written or visual materials in advance in an accessible file format so people will know what to expect and can plan ahead. This is important so that attendees can plan around their need to take breaks, arrive late, leave early, and so on. Accessible formats, sometimes called alternative, alternate formats, are ways of presenting printed, written, or visual material. People who may need this could be blind or low vision, have a learning disability that affects reading, or have a physical disability and be unable to hold or turn pages. Braille and large print are examples of alternate formats. Next, please. Give attendees the opportunity to share any additional accessibility requests that were not covered in the event's access information. Have an accessibility point person on your team who can assist with troubleshooting or access issues and provide contact information for this person. The best thing you can do is to be reachable so people can ask for additional support if needed. I have heard stories of people trying to access listening, assistive listening devices at performances only to find the staff had no idea where they were or how to use them. Market your accessible program to nonprofits working with people with disabilities. They are a great vehicle for spreading the word to the disability community about accessible arts events. Next, please. And finally, let's talk about preparing attendees for the event. Make it clear that they will have an opportunity to ask questions so they can prepare. If this is a live interactive session, allow attendees to send questions and comments in advance. Give notice about questions 
the participants might be asked to respond to so they can prepare even for icebreakers. For example, it's helpful to know in advance that the question, everyone introduce yourself and say where you're from, will be asked. Next, please. Make sure your events are accessible to augmentative and alternative communication users by offering multiple ways for attendees to participate, answer questions, submit questions, and interact. Many of these users are non-verbal. If you can, offer training sessions with the event organizers or volunteers prior to the event on how to use the platform the event will be hosted on. Remember, the more you can do, the better the chances are of increasing the diversity of your audience. As much information as you're able to provide in advance has a tone of being more welcoming and conscientious of people's needs. So, as a demonstration of taking into account people's needs, I have given you a lot of information and would like to pause for a minute while we shift gears. Feel free to stretch, put questions in the chat box, check out the stream text captioning link, and chill out for a moment. This next slide has a horizontal bar with a moving dark pink line. Next, please. Next, please. Welcome back. Now, let's talk about accessibility solutions for four groups of people with disabilities. Deaf, hard of hearing. And the reason there is a capital D and a small lowercase d is that those who identify as culturally deaf use a capital D and primarily use American Sign Language as their mean, means of communication. Small d deaf refers to those who may not consider themselves part of the deaf culture and may either be oral like myself or use a combination of speech and sign. There's a variation in lip reading skills. Then you also have blind low vision, deaf blind and neurodiverse. I actually lost my um, notes for a minute. So I want to talk a little bit, if you could go back to the uh, previous slide. The neurodiverse conditions encompass autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities. And they also include many invisible disabilities, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, learning disabilities, such as dys dyslexia, traumatic brain injury, diminished mental abilities due to a health condition, and so on. Next, please. Mm. So don't assume one size fits all. This is so important. Meeting the person where they're at is the best approach. For example, as I said earlier, not all people with hearing issues use ASL. Some people prefer ASL instead of captions, and others prefer captions because they do not know ASL. And similarly, for blind or low vision folks, some prefer audio description and others do not. The first step to respectfully interacting with people who have disabilities should be listening to how they talk about themselves. Add questions if you're not sure. Next, please. For the deaf and hard of hearing, live captioning is a great option that can be done by a CART reporter. CART stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation. This workshop is being captioned by Darlene who is actually doing this all the way from England. So you can have remote or local captioners doing this work. The beautiful thing about CART is that it benefits everyone, not just people with hearing loss, people whose second language is English, kids who are learning to read, etc. It benefits everyone. Second, caption all videos. YouTube has a great auto caption feature. However, be sure to review and edit because these auto-generated captions are not always accurate. 
other companies will capture for a small fee. If there is a method that will be used to vote or flag who can speak next, make sure all participants can access the process. There might be slight delays for those who are nonverbal or need to have the information translated, so take that into account. I do want to mention that sign language interpreters are also a great option. As you can see, this workshop is being interpreted. Next slide. So now for folks who are blind or low vision, make sure the speaker's face is well lit and can be clearly seen. And this also applies to people with hearing loss who lip read or rely on facial cues for communication. Describe live scenarios. For example, if you are presenting a live video tutorial of applying makeup, you could describe the process. I am now applying a dark purple lipstick to my upper lip. Describe any images, read any text that appears on screen, and describe anything that you just to add, as if you are explaining it to someone who isn't in the same room as you. Have speakers identify themselves when speaking and give a brief physical description. My name is so-and-so, and I'm wearing a bright red dress with a large yellow flower in the middle and I have short, straight brown hair and glasses. You only have to describe yourself once, and depending on the situation, you can identify yourself by name when you speak thereafter. Next, please. I'm going to read this real quick, but here are some tips for good visual access design. Things to do. Have good color contrast. Use large, readable fonts. Use linear layout with clear headers. Include text with images on your website or e-blast so they will be described for a person using a screen reader. This is all text in many programs. Things to avoid. Don't convey textual information within an image only because screen readers won't pick it up. Don't use color to convey meaning because of color blindness. And don't spread a layout all over the page. Next, please. I'd like to mention a population that's often excluded from accessibility and other equity discussions, the deaf-blind community. This community has its challenges because they depend entirely on tactile communication. They use an interpreter who signs in their hand. Adjustable lining is also helpful. Like I said earlier, every person has different needs. People should talk at a normal pace, not exaggerate, cover their mouth, or turn away. When describing something or showing how to do something, give them time to look between the next item and topic to give the deaf-blind person time to look at the item and then back to the interpreter or captions. Next, please. Allow the deaf-blind person to sign into the event early and have the interpreter or captioner ready to assist with setup and getting information where things are, for example, like the chat box. Identify who is talking, especially when there's a switch in the speaker. In a question and answer session, the deaf-blind person's response may be delayed, like I said earlier, because he or she is using an interpreter to get the information. Next, please. Audio description, I wanted to mention this um, here because it's really important for people who are blind or low vision and it provides an additional narration that describes important visual components and unspoken action of a piece of visual media or a live performance. For example, someone who is blind or low vision will not know that someone who is walking across the stage did a cartwheel. The audio describer would indicate that. This slide has a picture of a person with shoulder lumps, sandy brown hair, with glasses and a headset with sound equipment in front of her looking through a window into a theater and describing what they see. The logo AD for audio description is below. Check out the equipment next time you go to a movie. It's pretty amazing the detail that's provided. Next, please. Finally, 
Oops. I went too fast. So the last piece is on access for neurodiverse individuals. Clearly communicate the event length breaks and a typical filming style that could be triggering. Any of this triggering can be unpleasant for those who experience visual disturbance, dizziness, or pain. For example, there will be multiple cameras, where there will be multiple cameras cutting back and forth, loud noises, especially bright lights or strobing lights. This is so that people can plan for what they need, and the need acknowledging the need for breaks is really important. Let attendees know when intermissions occur and when performances will be paused. You can create a tip sheet for online platforms with step-by-step -step information about how to use the platform. Provide the option to attend training sessions about the platform before the event. And you can provide a sensory guide. This is a written or auditory for those with vision, vision difficulties, walkthrough of a play, or so highlighting potentially difficult sensory moments scene by scene. The social narrative of this kind really help to prepare attendees ahead of time. Next, please. If the program is open to video participation by attendees, understand that some people may need to move their bodies during the performance or program, and that's okay. It's their way of taking care of themselves. Ensure that the experience is inclusive to attendees who may need to adjust their surroundings to participate. Some people may need to lie down, and move, especially if they have lots of pain in their bodies. Next, please. I'm going to give you a few examples of accessibility in the arts. Next, please. This is an image showing a woman in a wheelchair with red tires and her arms are crossed over and arching upwards. She is on a black floor with bare gray walls and the lighting is sort of dimmed. So this is a clip from a short video performance by Alice Shepard, who identifies as a multiracial performer. This video has both captioning and an audio, audio description. This person is a, uh, this performer is a person of color with a disability, which you don't see very often. And this segment of the disability population is often overlooked. Intersectionality issues come into play when considering the needs of people of color who have disabilities. Next, please. The Whitney Museum and the Metro Metropolitan Museum of Art have Zoom meetings by deaf docents using ASL for specific exhibitions. And here's a quote by a deaf participant. That was very fun to see some artworks and discuss with remote, remote peers. It's really nice for people to be able to connect with people like themselves when it comes to enjoying the arts. Next, please. The Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery's Visit at Home has access programs online, includes ASL tours and audio description of select portraits. The Guggenheim Museum has an audio tour of its iconic building. Next, please. The Fry Art Museum right here in Seattle has guided artwork discussions. This is an image of a video clip. On the left is a person with a large multicolored dress standing on top of a rocky outcrop with a tree on the right hand side. There are two questions listed. Where might this scene take place? What do you see that makes you say that? And there is also captioning on this clip. Next, please. We have the Seattle Asian Art Museum also using audio tours. This is a clip of several choices of low, no vision tours with different topics listed. There are 44 tracks to choose from. On the left of the slide is an orange box with the letters SAM and the words Asian Art Museum next to them. Next, please. Finally, Howard Ron Theater Commons curated a fashion accessibility project, which was both captioned and ASL interpreted. In this screenshot, you can see four people in the front, one with a beige dress, one with a red sparkly dress, with a guide dog, 
another with a billowy short long sleeve white dress, and another with a short pink dress. There are two other people in the background. They are on a stage. What's happening is that these people are showcasing their outfits on, a, on the stage, and there are all kinds of people. Next, please. So now that we are living in the time of the coronavirus pandemic, we have to rethink the way we engage our constituencies. And as the art structure slowly starts to rebuild and more and more programming is converted to online platforms, what better time to integrate accessibility into the fabric of the organization and account for all segments of the population who can benefit from arts and culture? So I've given you a lot of information and there are so many resources out there and I want to acknowledge the many individuals and organizations that have worked so hard to make accessibility a reality in arts and culture and to help make this workshop happen. Thank you so much for all of your help and your support. Next, please. And now we come to the fun part, a discussion with Mickey Rowe and Helen Marion, moderated by Kathy Schiff. Next, please. I want to introduce Kathy. She is the Cultural Partnerships and Grant Manager for the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, a change agent in transforming the office's community engagement and arts funding practices through a racial equity lens. She helped the agency earn the Seattle Management Association's first Race and Social Justice Management Award and is a local award-winning theater artist. Welcome, Kathy, and thank you so much for your staunch support of the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, again, my name is Kathy, and uh, today I am wearing a purple dress top um, and uh, a black a uh, casual jacket, long sleeve jacket with pink trim. Um, my hair is uh, black and I have brown eyes. Uh, my hair is pulled back today, it's very long. Um, and I am Asian American. I'm so excited to be here today to introduce um, uh, our two guest speakers. Um, next slide, please. Mickey Rowe, uh, Hia Hyum, is the founder and artistic director of National Disability Theater. Their productions reimagine disability and universal design as key storytelling and design elements, showcasing that people can be successful, not just in spite of their challenges, but also because of them. He was the first autistic actor to play Christopher Boone, the lead role in the Tony award-winning play, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. He has appeared as the title role in the Tony Award-winning play Amadeus and much more. Next slide. Helen Marion, she, her, is an immigrant POC, people of color, person of color, actor, teaching artist, model, dancer, and singer, who also is the operations and marketing manager of Center Stage Theater. She is a former host of the weekly lifestyle segment on Seattle's CW channel, and in the past has led a T-Mobile training series on leadership, inclusion, equity, and diversity. Her degree program had a special focus on theater and education, and she has done local, national, and international educational tours. Welcome, Nikki and Helen. Thank, Thank you, so, you much so much for having us, Kathy. <laughs> it's great to see you today. Um, so I have some questions. We're going to have a conversation um, uh, between the three of us, and then we will go to question and answer. So if you do have questions, you can type them into the chat um, throughout this time, and the moderators will be uh, collecting those. Um, um, and then when we move into the question and answer session. But first, uh, question for you, uh, Mickey. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience living with a disability um, and how that has made you such a strong advocate of accessibility in the arts? Absolutely. Well, first off, for those who are blind or low vision, I am a white man with very short hair, currently light brown, that's just been buzzed because of COVID. <laughs> um, I have blue eyes, my hair is thinning a little bit, I'm wearing a black v-neck and a maroon jacket um, and my pronouns are he him 
And I am an Asian woman. I have long dark hair. Today I'm wearing a gray cardigan and a purple shirt. Yeah, and we are local Seattleites, but we work with organizations like La Jolla Playhouse, The Goodman, and Lincoln Center Theater as accessibility consultants. Uh, also, I just wanted to say really quickly, I realized that the one minute break we got isn't always enough time to use the restroom if you have a mobility disability. So if you need a longer break or need to use the restroom, feel free to get up and do whatever you need to do while I'm speaking and we won't be offended. <laughs> um, so feel free to move around. But back to your question, um, how has my experience living with a disability made me into an advocate? Now, I really think, Kathy, that people with disabilities, our whole lives have really been told indirectly to stay home, stay hidden, stay unemployed. Often people don't even mention the fact that people don't want us to even mention the fact that we have a disability. And in fact, no one else is even going to say the D word. How often do you notice people saying special or all abilities, handy capable when they actually mean disabled? And so people are so afraid to truly include disability that they don't even want to say the word or acknowledge its existence sometimes, which is therefore sort of refusing to acknowledge my existence. Um, so why do I advocate for myself? Uh, because according to Money Watch, pre-COVID, this is before everyone was unemployed, according to Money Watch, 85% of college graduates on the autism spectrum are unemployed. I'm gonna say that again. 85% of college graduates on the autism spectrum are unemployed, according to Money Watch, pre-COVID, right? And we know that the census tells us that disabled folks make up 20% of the population. So a study done by the Ruderman Family Foundation and another by the Ford Foundation found that only 1% of the roles we see on TV and in movies have, are disabled. 1% of roles are disabled. And of that 1% of roles that are disabled, the Ford Foundation found that 95% of those roles are played by non-disabled actors. So there's really a lack of visibility in the disability community. Um, and that's all happening even though we make up 20% of the population according to the census. Even here locally in Seattle, I, I feel like maybe a couple years ago, um, a really large, uh, I believe Equity House did a show that was specifically about autism, but wasn't able to include the disability community in any way, even though they were reached out to and provided lots of resources. Um, often theaters don't even feel like they can include the disability community in post-show discussions about shows that are about disability. So I feel like my options were stay home, never have a job, never work in theater, um, or start banging down doors. And because I decided to fight for myself, I've now gotten to keynote speak at the Lincoln Center and Kennedy Center and the Yale School of Drama, at the Gershwin Theater on Broadway and direct a show at La Jolla Playhouse. Um, so I think that that's why I advocate for myself because um, otherwise really the other option for disabled folks right now is to be home and often unemployed. Um, I think the other really interesting thing is to jump back to something I said just a second ago. It's really important, I think, when we look at these accessibility issues and how to make our um, organizations more accessible, that we also look at the cultural landscape of the disability community, that those two things have to kind of happen together to be really successful and fun and sexy, right? Um, and in the disability community right now, there's a big push getting people comfortable saying the word disability. There's the hashtag, say the word. Um, Lawrence Carter Long, I believe started it, but you can Google say the word. Um, people often use words like special needs to describe people with autism or Down syndrome. Um, and there's a great video by, you can also look up by the Down Syndrome Society talking about this, but special would be if I needed to eat dinosaur eggs for breakfast or something like that. Or special would be if I needed to sleep in a tree or wear a suit of armor, right? Um, but what I really need is I need employment. I need love and support. 
and I need to be invited to the diversity and inclusion table. And those are human needs, right? There isn't really anything special about them. Uh, so Google say the word. Um, yeah, and then, uh, but I think that answers your question about why I'm an advocate. That's so great, Mickey. I know I, we first met actually online uh, a, a number of years ago because everywhere I was talking about racial diversity, um, uh, all of a sudden this person named Mickey Rowe would pop up uh, in social platforms and, and be talking about disability rights. And then we started talking together about that intersectionality. Absolutely. Um, so um, Helen, I wanna bring you into the conversation. As you know, um, the disability movement has, um, rights movement has been historically very white. Um, and I'd love for you as a woman of color, uh, a mother of a disabled son and a partner to a disabled man um, to talk about what is top of mind for you um, as we talk about accessibility for all in the arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, being mother of a disabled son, uh, partner of a disabled man, uh, it makes disability rights issues hit really close to home for me. But I think uh, as a woman of color, uh, it's top of mind to me to be calling in my communities, women and people of color, to be fierce allies for the disability community. We talk about how the disability rights movement has historically been very white. Well, so has the theater and arts world in this country. It's been very white, very heteronormative, very cisgendered, very male-centric, very ableist. But I think this has been changing. And I think we have gotten to a point now where a lot of arts organizations would say that diversity is important to them. It's something that they actively work towards. But I think I'm seeing a lot of these organizations think that diversity just means race, and gender parity. So as long as they have some cisgendered women and some people of color involved, they've got diversity handled. And I think as a woman of color, I have benefited from this. And I'm now finding myself with a seat at the table more often than I used to. So I think now it is my job to say, hello, I'm so glad to be here. It's about time. Uh, where are the trans folks? Where are the disabled folks? They should be here at the table as well, intersectionality, like we were just talking about. I truly believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. And I promise y'all that the ableist, patriarchy, white supremacy will not like if the disabled folks and the POC join forces and, and lift each other up. You know, I'm seeing that the disability rights movement has historically been very white, but things are changing. I think about Mickey's company, National Disability Theater. Last year, 97% of the actors were disabled but 55% of those were non-male, 50% of those were people of color, 27% were queer. Uh, Sins Invalid is a nationally touring company uh, which centers uh, people of color, queers, non-binary and trans people with disabilities. That's from their description, how they describe themselves. So like it is changing and I'd love to see people of color really making a push. And everyone in Sins well. Invalid has everyone, a disability. Everyone in Sins Invalid has a disability. So things are changing and I am like, people of color, let's do this too. Like, just like we tell white people to not make us do all the emotional labor and educate themselves and educate their fellow white people. I'm like, come on, non-disabled POC, let's do this too. Let's educate ourselves on disability rights issues. Let's educate our fellow non-disabled peers and that rising tide will lift all boats. I love that. It's, uh, we're all stronger together, correct? Yes, mm -hmm. truly. Uh, so Mickey, I, I want it, um, you, I've heard you talk a lot and very um, eloquently about um, saying that most autistic people don't necessarily want performances or experiences to be modified, such as adjusting lighting or sound for relaxed mm -hmm. performances. When it comes to creating virtual experiences, are there ways to make them more engaging to autistic people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, so exactly what you said. I think historically in Seattle and across the country, when you look at organizations that do sensory friendly performances, um, often we've been hearing to change things about the show, but those organizations aren't hiring autistic adults or working with the autistic community, working with autistic adults to find out what the autistic community actually wants. And when we talk to these people, uh, we find out that people, autistic people wanna be able to experience the same show everyone else is experiencing. And we just need things like proper notice of what's gonna happen and almost like a trigger warning uh, so that we can enjoy the same show that everyone else is enjoying. 
Um, so that's the concept called nothing about us without us. If you're gonna do something involving the autistic community, um, then make sure that you have autistic people leading the conversation, right? I think the other thing is that this should, all of this work should be fun. And it's all just like that, right? It's really hard for a company to retech an entire show just to have a sensory friendly performance. That's a lot of work, right? But when you include autistic people or include people with disabilities to find out what they really need, it's often so much cheaper, so much easier, less work and more fun, right? Because disabled people are the best creative problem solvers that there are in the world, right? That's called disability gain, right? What do you gain from having a disability? Um, and all of you out there watching, right? You are all fun, sexy, creative problem solvers too. And so we should really be the best allies. But in terms of making online content better for people with autism, I think we just look at the tenets of universal design. One of those is providing equal options, right? So if someone maybe is uncomfortable with being seen on video, have the call in phone, the phone line that you can call into Zoom, uh, make sure people know that's an option too, and that it's an equal option. You can be just as valuable to our team calling in on the phone as you can be participating on video. Things like still doing a sensory friendly pre-show speech before um, a Zoom meeting. So saying we are all at home and we are all going to do, we're all gonna focus during this Zoom meeting in whatever way works best for us. And we're going to trust everyone else to focus in whatever way works best for them too. So if someone needs to get up and pace around and move to focus best, go for it. We trust you. We know nothing's wrong. We're going to let you do your thing. Um, and just naming stimming so that non-autistic people on the call know what stimming is maybe and know that it's not a bad thing. It's not a problem. It doesn't mean the person's not functioning or not doing well. That stimming actually means that the person is self-regulating and doing what they need to do to stay focused and productive. And for those who don't know, stimming is the kind of stereotypical rocking motions or hand flapping movements um, or tapping that autistic people sometimes do. And I like to point out to my non-autistic peers that y'all do this too. If you've ever been anxious and been like wringing your hands or like bit your lip, like that's the same thing. You are feeling overwhelmed by things outside of you. So you're giving yourself some stimulus that you can control to help you cope. That's stimming. Autistic people maybe might do it more often or in ways that seem bigger to non-autistic people, but it's the same thing. There's nothing to be concerned about. So I think it's really important to say things like that at the top of a Zoom meeting. So a non-autistic person knows if we see someone in a Zoom box mm -hmm. stimming or rocking, like, it's fine. It's just fine. Everything is fine. In, and whether it's in the virtual plane or in the in-person plane, absolutely, everyone, right? That universal concept. I'm the person who's always like shaking my leg under the table to release. Yes. It. So when you really center the work on the um, uh, the disability community or person of color or um, whether it's gender or any other the social categories that have often been oppressed, you actually make it better for everyone because lots of people need that time to stretch to um, make themselves more comfortable. Absolutely <laughs> correct. And I think the final thing that's really helpful for people, specifically people on the spectrum for things like Zoom meetings, um, is because a lot of the communication can often be nonverbal or things that aren't intuitive to people on the spectrum, uh, like sarcasm or just all sorts of things that aren't intuitive to people on the spectrum. Email out a summary at the end of the Zoom meeting with just maybe five bullet points. Here's what we said, here's what we agreed upon, and here's the next steps. Just so everyone's on the same page and there aren't any miscommunications from that, from those communications that aren't intuitive to people on the spectrum. That's great. Um, so I know that the disability community has long been asking for more online virtual options and opportunities. Um, and they've actually said that uh, they've always wanted this to be an option, not just now when people can't gather for in-person events. When, are, when we're finally able to transition back to in-person events, do you see advantages for organizations in being able to continue providing both live and virtual programming? Absolutely, yeah, this should always be an option. Um, however, I think live streaming should always be done in addition to all the other access and inclusion things that the theaters are already doing, not as a replacement 
for accessible spaces and accommodations, right? Um, online shouldn't be used to segregate disabled and non-disabled audiences by making the only one access option for disabled folks participating from home. But for a lot of people with disabilities, getting out the door and attending the theater in person just isn't possible or reasonable. And that doesn't mean these people don't want to attend your theater or become a subscriber or a donor. It just means that your theater and the travel to get the, to the theater simply isn't accessible to them. So disability conferences, there is always an option to attend remotely via live stream um, for both participants and speakers to help make the event as fully accessible as possible, right? At National Disability Theater's kickoff event, for example, Claudia Alec was not able to attend in person uh, for disability reasons. And so instead she brought down the house uh, with her lecture remotely over video. Um, and so I think as we consider this accommodation, uh, we need to make sure though also that this live streaming when we open back up, hopefully and have theater in person continues into all aspects to really fully include people with disabilities, right? So if we live stream the performance and then there's a post-show discussion or something afterwards, make sure we live stream that too so that the people with disabilities can really be fully included and make sure that if you are live streaming that post-show discussion, that there's a way to, um, for those people digitally to ask questions, right? Via email or text message or something like that so they can really participate. That reminds me of one other thing though uh, that I just wanted to say really quickly. Um, that it uh, a lot of this webinar right now, it looks like, is using the chat box feature for questions and, and answers coming up. And often for people like me who are legally blind to use large print, um, that or having only one option like chat box sometimes doesn't work because the text in the chat box is so small and there's no way for me to make it large print, right? For question and answers. Um, but I, but if we think about universal design, we can provide lots of options and they are often cheaper and easier than you would think. So if anyone has any questions um, and either the chat box isn't accessible to you or we simply don't get time for your question, you can feel free to email us at romickey at nationaldisabilitytheater.org um, and we can answer your question that way if the chat box doesn't work for you for whatever reason or we don't get time for your questions. One other really quick example of nothing about us without us um, that I think is really funny and interesting. Uh, does anyone know, you know, the National Theater of Great Britain, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Yes. They worked really hard. They spent millions of dollars on these caption glasses. Oh, right? great. Have you seen these caption glasses? Yes. Um, and it turns out that a lot of people who want to use captions either wear cochlear implants or use over ear hearing aids, or maybe are aging, just like we heard so many of the, so much of the population is and wear glasses. And for anyone who wears glasses or has cochlear implants or uses over ear hearing aids, these caption glasses aren't always the best option, right? And so that's just one example of where if the National Theater of Great Britain had included people with disabilities in these conversations, leading the conversations from the beginning, they would have saved millions of dollars on this technology when it turns out often the easiest things um, are the most helpful too, right? I think about the work National Disability Theater does with La Jolla Playhouse, right? Every theater has uh, sound designers. Every theater has uh, projection designers, right? And all of a sudden, if you have projections then bam, you have, now you have captions for your show that are artistic and dynamic and designed as part of the production and actually add to the storytelling and help everyone. Or um, if you have sound design, right? National Disability Theater had the audio descriptions for our show built in so that um, they were part of the sound design, part of the auditory storytelling for the whole world. It wasn't something people had to opt into necessarily, um, but by doing this, it made it cheaper for the theater. It made it easier for the theater because it was using technology they already have and use for every show. 
and it was just more exciting, dynamic, sexier storytelling. I liked it as a non-disabled person whenever there'd be audio description because there's so much happening on stage. You don't always see everything. And then the audio description, I was like, oh, yes, that was mm-hmm. a cool thing that happened. So everybody wins. Universal design, everybody wins. Universal design helps everyone, right? I think about when I'm on my phone watching a video, maybe I'm in the library or maybe I'm um, in a, at a doctor's office yeah, or on not my earbuds. public transportation. I use the captioning, right? Uh, so this helps all, it makes, when we use universal design, not only does it help the disability community, but it helps all of our patrons, right? Audio description helps everyone, captions help everyone. If you're at the airport and you're pulling your luggage, are you going to use the ramp or are you going to use the stairs? You're going to use the ramp because that accessibility universal design has made your life easier as well. (laughs) So when we think about the question about, will like, Will there be advantage to continuing doing these live virtual events? Like, yes, it's going to help the disability community who's always been asking for this. It's going to help parents, maybe their sitter, like flaked on them. Now they can still see the show that they were planning on doing. Those who are medically fragile. Um, I think COVID's probably always going to be with us. So then you know, like, oh, my temperature rose. I probably should stay home. But you can still see the show. So I think there's so much advantage for so many people. Right. The elderly um, people yeah. who maybe you just, uh, my husband recently just injured his foot. So it's hard for him to get around. Um, and so, but he can still enjoy things if they're live streamed or online as an option, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it makes sense. Yeah, back to the in-person event, that, that we want it. that option. Yes, options, options, we love those. I think you actually already answered the next question. So I'm just going to reframe it um, um, and then we'll move to the Q&A. So again, if people have questions, um, be sure you're putting them in the chat window. Uh, So this pandemic, um, as awful as it is, has actually created um, an opportunity for we in the arts and culture sector because ours was the first sector to kind of close down um, because of the event bans and the stay-at-home orders um, and will probably be the last to open back up. So it gives us time to really reflect on um, um, new ways of thinking and working, um, as opposed to, I know some people have said, let's, when we can get back to what we used to have. But I like to think of it and, and challenge us to really think about what do we want the world to actually be moving forward? Yes. Um, what do we take with us into the future? And what do we change to actually make it more um, equitable for all people truly um and so are there um what are some next steps that you think very specific steps that groups can take um while we're still explore well we're using this time to explore these virtual avenues so i think it's definitely the ability for us to do the both and after um so do you have specific ideas um about how we do that um move working together moving forward Absolutely. Yeah. I think that a lot of the specific steps we saw in Elizabeth's amazing presentation um, and a lot of those specific steps too, though, are, they can feel so overwhelming when we see all of these different concepts that are brand new to us all at once. Um, And really not every single thing is going to apply to every arts organization. And what's more helpful is getting that one-on-one of here's your arts organization, here's your budget, here's the tools you already have, let's be creative problem solvers together and think about how we can make this work for the most people possible using universal design. So I would say probably the first thing that would be so wonderful as arts organizations open back up is this is a time when we really get to look at our staff, we get to look at our boards, we get to look at our leadership and see whether the diversity that we've been wanting to happen in our audience is actually reflected in the staff and on the board, right? And make sure we have diversity on the leadership team, make sure we have diversity in our staff, make sure we have diversity on our board and make sure that that diversity includes leaders with disabilities as well. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think disability is really the only equal opportunity minority group uh, anyone can join our prestigious club at any time uh, and will, should they be lucky enough to live long enough, right? So even I think as you rebuild your organization, even if you don't care about diso- disabled folks, do it for you, right? 
you could go out and check your mail, get hit by a car, and then suddenly you have a disability. Um, and when that happens, will you still want your job? Will you still want to be able to go out and see a show with your friends, right? This pandemic came up so unexpectedly, and then all of a sudden, y'all have to stay home, <laughs> just like disabled folks have for much of their lives, right? So suddenly, y'all care about virtual programming, just like the disability community has been asking for for a long time. So what I would say is really think about disability on a personal level, and when things open back up, don't just don't do it for the disability community. Do it for you, right? It's being universal accessibility is only going to help you and your future self. And the best way to do that is by involving adults with disabilities um, from the beginning. That's beautifully put. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, transition now and bring um, Elizabeth back onto the screen. Uh, and open up our Q&A. We already have some questions um, in the queue. And again, if you have other questions, please put, put them in the chat. Even if we're not able to get to all the questions in the chat, we will find some way to address them, put them out um, when we send out stuff. I know there was a quick question I saw about uh, making sure we got Nikki's email address that you had uh, mentioned earlier into the chat. And we'll definitely um, send out a follow-up uh, communication. I think Elizabeth already has that planned out so that you'll have uh, all the information that you need from this um, uh, session today. So um, the first question I have, and uh, actually I think this applies um, uh, for any of you, um, to be honest, um, and Mickey, you might have some very specific things about this. So um, the question is some feedback um, in an arts organization that this person is in, um, is that the perception of trigger warning sets people up to be upset instead of preparing people for potentially upsetting content. What do you think about including language like content includes instead of the words trigger warning? Or is there something lost in translation there? You know, I think I work really, I, I know there are lots of different views in the disability community. And I think as long as we're doing the best we can, and we think about possible, not perfect, right? Always possible, not perfect. Um, really, we can spend all day and all night getting upset about words we use and word choice. But if the company is doing the thing, that's great. And if you have found for your company saying content includes works better for you than saying trigger warning, that is great. And I think that it's just so great that you are doing the work and making the thing happen and that's so much more important than us, than the specific words, if that makes sense. Yeah. Does anyone yeah. else? Yeah, yeah, I will add um, that um, you're not gonna make everybody happy. Um, mm -hmm. There's going to be different uh, perspectives from different people in the disability community. But like Mickey says, you're doing the right thing by communicating what's available and what's going to happen. And I think that's the most important thing that is that your intentions are in the right place. Yeah. And I think as long as we're talking with a wide variety of groups, it's that intersectionality again. As a trauma survivor myself, I do like trigger warnings, but I'm totally up for talking to a disability community about maybe trigger warning might be a good word or not a good word. Like, I think we just need each other and to less of like, we're just gonna do this and decide that this is the best word. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just be unafraid of conversations with groups um, and we'll figure it out together. I think it's all gonna have to be very collaborative um, moving forward, which I think we've all said for a long time that we want. And this is our chance to like, let's do it. Let's collaborate all kind of groups working together. And Great. then we'll find that best language. So I think what I've been hearing all throughout today's conversation is really like, really including people in the conversation. So the greater diversity you have of people making the decisions about all of this stuff, you're gonna, it, it, we're never gonna achieve perfection and we shouldn't, um, but, but that that will make sure that we've included all the different perspectives that might weigh into the decision of what's ultimately um, decided upon. Um, uh, we also have a question on um, uh, Elizabeth. Can you address why, uh, why use an interpreter when you have captions? Why is it important to include both? That's a really good question. Um, and there's several reasons. Um, one is that people who sign really appreciate the facial um, cues that they get from interpreting. 
um, the Tagalog emotion, non-verbal language that's conveyed through interpreting. So they get a lot more from that than they do the captions. Um, another reason is that um, some people may not be able to read English um, as well as others. So um, it's a good option for others who want to see the facial cues and be more expressive. So that's the main reason. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna throw this out to uh, 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 Nikki first, and then Elizabeth, if you have thoughts, um, trying to, and, and actually I would love Helen, since you are also a theater artist yourself and um, um, training. Um, so the reality is, is that we know how inequitable, um, like uh, with any kind of performance art, um, the whole arts industry, the whole world actually is still very inequitable when it comes to access for people with disabilities, um, um, people of color, um, uh, even gender still. Yeah. And the reality is, is that, so as inequitable as it is um, in terms of our performance venues, our museums, um, but if someone, for instance, Helen, your child, if, if say he wanted to grow up and be a theater artist or Mickey, your own experience, I mean, how, how do we make the whole uh, pipeline of anyone wanting to pursue this um, and create opportunities for how they can get training, um, the training just like anyone else can um, in order to really pursue this as a profession? Yeah. I think that there's really two steps to that. Um, one is looking at the, step one is looking at the training organizations. And step two is looking at the other way people can get training, which is on the ground experience in organizations, right? So if we start by looking at the training institutions, I think people, the training institutions need to be doing this work too, right? I don't know if um, anyone from University of Washington or Cornish are on this call or not, but um, they need to do this work too. And it's, it's little things that make a big difference when we think about universal design. I think a lot of times people hear disability or think meeting someone with a disability or even interviewing someone with a disability would be scary sometimes because they just don't know, right? And I think the less scary we can make it, the better. So I went to UW and at that time, I was much less able to pass as non-autistic as I am now. So I've worked really hard to be able to pass as non-autistic, which takes a lot of energy and you can do it for short little periods of time, right? But, um, but when I was at school, I had a lot of tension and stimming in my hands all the time. And I was told I would never work if I couldn't get rid of the stimming in my hands and if I couldn't get rid of the tension in my hands. Um, and so in every class, no matter what I did, the only notes I got were about my hands, whether I was doing Shakespeare class or Chekhov or voice or Alexander technique or right, or scene study, right? Instead of the notes I was getting being about the acting that was going on, the connections, my ability to change my scene partner and be changed by them, the notes were only about my hands for four years, right? So I didn't get very much personally out of that program. But I think, um, so I think one part is universal design, right? Like this is an example of universal design, my business card, it's accessible to everyone. So on this side, it has the normal small print text. It has the braille text as well. If you can see there's braille fonts on it. And then on the other side, it has the large print text. Uh, so for anyone, this so that like it's so, so easy to make something small like that accessible for everyone it doesn't cost a lot of money and school's the same way right if we want to be creative and think about the most important thing for an actor just being that they're alive that they're a living breathing human being right i think that's what we do as actors schools can just be more creative about being accessible and not get so stuck on little things like finding neutral which is really hard for many people with many disabilities to find neutral and can I step in and say mm -hmm. something about schools here? So I work in schools a lot as a teaching artist. I'm usually in there doing race related shows and I'm like, okay, this is my classroom now, this is my chance. So before I do any show, I give my pronouns, I do an image description. I let students know if they're on the autism spectrum, this is a show, you are welcome to pace, you are welcome to rock. 
And so just in that little way, I have normalized for a whole classroom of public school students that dis, uh, the theater industry thinks about you with disabilities. And without me telling them like, you could be an actor one day, just an actor coming into their classroom, normalizing disability, I think plays a part in that. So that's something that I do just every time I'm in a school, any school. And then I think the other thing that all of the theater professionals can do is realizing that um, university training or um, that that kind of training is not the be all and end all, that that devalues lived experience. People with autism are acting their whole lives, right? I script a lot of the things I say. If I go into a coffee shop, right, I'll say, hi, how are you today? Can I please have a small coffee? And if more conversations needed, because I've scripted it, I'll say, how has your day been today? Has it been busy or slow? And then no matter what the barista says, if they say, yes, it's been busy or no, it's been slow, I can then say, um, oh, would you like it better when it's busy or slow? You know what I mean? I just, I have scripted conversation so that, um, that I use in my daily life. And I work really hard that when I'm talking to someone for them not to know that I've pre-scripted what I'm saying, that for them to think that it's live in the moment that I'm coming up with these words on the spot. And that's my same job as an actor, right? So I like, as an actor now, I've not, I don't think that I got very much training as an actor professionally because of my disability. Um, I had before, when I was working, mostly working locally in Seattle, I hadn't really gotten any speaking roles anywhere. Curious Incident was my first role where I, that was a speaking role. <laughs> um, and we did that nine times a week for three, four months. Um, and so, Right, but um, New York New York Times reviews it and and loves my act, loved it and gave us great reviews. Uh, Wall Street Journal reviewed uh, our Amadeus, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it goes to show that when we value lived experience as equal to that kind of in-school training, that can help really equalize those. Sorry, did that answer make yes, sense at all? I think that, that's great, Elizabeth. Yes, um, Mickey said it beautifully and so did Helen. Um, I want to introduce a concept that I don't think a lot of people uh, have in the forefront of their consciousness, and that is the term of an ally. I think uh, we need more allies speaking out um, about this issue because we do live in an ableist society. And I think that the more people who speak out about that, about putting people with disabilities um, on a more level pedestal would be best. Um, and we often see we have this um, bystander intervention kind of philosophy where you see something happen, but you don't speak out about it. And I think that needs to change. Um, and being an ally is a really great way to do that. Thank and you. And Elizabeth, this is borrowed, from, this is one other thing that organizations can do to help this too, but this is borrowed from the deaf community. The con so the, the deaf community was the first to come up with the, the idea of deaf gain. What does someone gain from being deaf? And then the larger disability community has sort, have sort of borrowed that from the deaf community and said disability gain, right? But um, I think the big thing is, is if you think about, there's the social model of disability and the medical model. And the medical model says, this person has a disability, there is something wrong with them, there is a problem that needs to be fixed, they are deficient in something, and that's what a disability is. That's the medical model. And the social model says, we are all just people. Disability is not about the different, difference is a thing, difference is okay, difference is wonderful. Disability is not about the difference as much as the environment. And what do we need to change in the environment to make everyone equal? right? So that disability isn't about me being deficient. Disability is about this text being 12 point font instead of eight point font. Disability is about this space not being accessible, right? Um, so as we shift to the social model of disability and think about disability gain, organizations can think, what is this person bringing to the table because of their lived experience? And how is that a plus for our organization? How is the way that their brain is wired differently from everyone else's a plus for our organization? 
I love that. That's I, actually with racial equity, we do the same thing as people of color. Um, rather than a lot of people always think, oh, they they don't have as much education or they don't have as much um, income or they're, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a lot of negative stereotypes. But the reality is, is we have so much more resilience. We've had to deal with so much. We can do so much more because of what we've had to live through because of um, uh, racist and structural um, uh, systemic issues in our country that uh, we have so much expertise we're able to bring in um, into any situation and that we should use an asset framework to really look at all people. Um, yeah. uh, so it's the same thing, intersectionality, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, I wanted to actually uh, uh, close with asking you a specific question, um, but actually because mm -hmm. Elizabeth, you brought up that example of like bystander training. So since this session is about how do you make virtual events more accessible? I wanna just give two quick examples of what just happened in uh, a couple of different Zoom meetings I was in. In one Zoom meeting I was in, uh, different people, not just people who are, are hard of hearing or deaf, um, were having trouble with their sound. Um, um, but uh, so the, the moderator kept on telling people <laughs> what they needed to do to fix their sound. And, and the reality was, this, and, the, and one of the questions was someone was having trouble figuring out how to get the live captioning up and they were just explaining it all verbally. And so I finally, it was, it was frustrating me because I was like private messaging the moderators to, to not call them out, to just private message. You have to type it into the chat so they can actually see because they can't hear anything you're saying because they're having a problem with the sound. Um, yeah. And then finally they didn't respond to that. So finally I just did an everyone chat message to just say, here's the link you go to to get the live captioning. Um, so that's a way that you can actually be a bystander ally in a Zoom virtual setting. The other one was just today, um, We uh, the cameras were set up um, in advance, uh, but I didn't realize until I started watching it that the uh, name covers the bottom part of your box. So the interpreter's hands were sometimes going being covered up by their name and I was worried that people who needed the ASL interpretation couldn't see it so I private messaged both interpreters to say re-angle your camera so that your hands are actually in the center of the screen above your name and those are just ways that you can support each other um, um, in a zoom virtual setting as was the set but the question I want to close with is um, given the topic of our conversation today of the different arts events um, that you've experienced or participated in in the last two months, perhaps, or even before then, that were in an online or virtual setting. Is there any quick um, highlight of something that was like, wow, that really made me feel, I loved that, uh, of what they did that made that virtual or online um, uh, uh, program uh, feel more inclusive and uh, based on universal design? Or on the flip side, was there a big no-no that you saw where you just felt like you completely lost access to what was going on because they did not take something into consideration? And if each of you can actually just maybe highlight one thing that is either a really plus and or uh, something that was a big no-no that people should be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I think of one uh, Zoom call that I went to where at the start, the moderator was just like, hey, we're at home grab water if you need to if your kids or your pets come in that's fine if you need a pace that's fine they weren't very like formal i feel like some of the things we talked about seem like very formal ways of mm -hmm. disability inclusion i was just so conversational just normalizing disability needs and needs that people could just have that i really love that it was just so casual like we're all here we're all at home whatever you need to do i thought that was so well done that it was just so casual and normalized um, I think we're building a new culture right now with Zoom calls, and we can either make it where we all have to sit very still, center frame, or we can just be real with each other. Which, which is also relaxing the rules of whiteness too. You know, it all intersects. It all mm -hmm. intersects. <laughs> Great. Um, I think that one thing that I saw that was really incredible is it was a, um, it was not live. It was a video. They had created a video of a performance, um, and it was a dance performance by a. A company where um, all of the dancers in this performance were using wheelchairs. Um, but what they had done is the way they had used audio description. Audio description was not something you needed to opt into. It was just included as part of the soundscape, as part of the artistic soundscape of this video. And it was poetic. It was beautiful. It was um, almost like listening to an audio book, you know, and it, even though I personally would not um, opt into using audio description for watching a video of these dancers. 
um, it really enhanced my experience too. And it was just beautiful and really added to the art of the experience. Dance is so much ahead of theater when it comes to audio description. And we can all look at um, a lot of dance companies in New York for easy, uh, affordable, creative ways to audio describe things. Terrific. And Elizabeth? I just want to say one thing. Um, if someone asks you a question and you don't really understand why they're at making that request, be curious. Ask questions. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And I think there's a lot of fear. We live in a very fear-based society. So um, relax. No one's going to stop your head off. Just be curious and ask questions. Great. Thank you all so much. It was so great chatting with all of you. And thank you for all your questions. Again, we were definitely not able to get, we've had so many questions. Um, so we will look at those and figure out a way to address them in future webinars, perhaps in information sheets and definitely stuff to share out. I wanna turn things back over to Alexa, who will, uh, with Rooted in Rights, who will close us out today. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, one second here. Um, we are going to share the recorded video and the resources. So please do follow the Seattle um, Accessibility Consortium on Facebook. Contact Seattle, C-A-C, that's S-E-A-T-T-L-E, C-A-C, at gmail.com with any questions or comments that you have. We would love your feedback. Please fill out the survey that will be emailed to you. And your support is appreciated. Uh, donations can be made at bit.ly slash S-C-A-C S-H-U-N-P-I-K-E. That's bit.ly slash S-C-A-C Shunpike. And that link is also posted in the chat as well. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope you have a great rest of your day.